Author Richard Matheson was born in New Jersey and grew up in Brooklyn. After graduating from high school, he joined the military and fought in World War II as an infantry soldier. He earned his bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Missouri in 1949 and moved to California where he began to write fiction in a celebrated career that would span the next 63 years. Matheson's professional writing debut was a short story he wrote at age 22 called Born of Man and Woman, the story of a mutant child whose abusive parents have kept him chained to a basement wall. The story is written in the form of a diary as the child sees glimpses of the outside world through a small window. The narrative asks the terrifying question, who is the real monster here? And the work would eventually receive induction into the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. Matheson would later revisit and explore upon this theme with the novel I Am Legend, a post-apocalyptic fiction in which Robert Neville is the last man left alive. The unstoppable after-effects has killed much of humanity and mutated the human gene, resurrecting them into what Robert calls vampires, dead, once-human creatures that attack at night. Neville has devoted his daylight hours to exterminating the monsters, while at night he barricades himself in his home and listens to those who were once his neighbors howl for his blood. How long can a man's sanity last in such conditions? With I Am Legend, Matheson brought vampires out of the realms of mythic superstition and folklore and into a 20th century landscape of science gone wrong. Metabolic abnormality had caused a bacterial mutation. These zombies can be studied and perhaps even cured. Beneath its horror and sci-fi veneer, the novel explores themes of loneliness and monotony that would come with being the last person on Earth. It asks questions about survival and violence and explores the psychology of grief, loneliness, memory, betrayal, and depression. It becomes clear that there are no real heroes or villains in this story, just two groups, each of which fears and is equally alien to the other. Neville accepts his own mortality and his isolation from the rest of the new world. As the last man alive, he realizes that himself and the entire human race will soon dissolve into a distant and forgotten memory. Neville's realization leads him to utter the book's final line and title, I Am Legend. The suggestion being that, to the vampires, Neville is a terrifying supernatural creature who needs to be destroyed before he can kill again. It would not be long until the rights to the book were purchased with the intention of adapting the story for the big screen in what would become The Last Man on Earth. The book would be, very loosely, adapted again in 1971's The Omega Man. Whilst the script would deviate from the source material by altering several key story beats, the movie would acquaint a whole new generation of audience members with Matheson's work. Most of Matheson's initial themes and nuance would give way to Charlton Heston driving around machine gunning down a race of cloaked pale-faced mutants. The catalyst for Neville's predicament in this retelling was a nuclear war between the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union, when American interception missiles break up warheads carrying biological warfare material, most of the world's population is killed. Since the release of The Omega Man, Warner Brothers would periodically renew the option rights to make further adaptations of Matheson's book, and the idea would always remain a passion of Warner Brothers' then Senior Vice President of Production, Lorenzo de Bonaventura. His path would collide with writer Mark Protosevich. Protosevich had moved to Hollywood in the late 1980s and started developing films, first as a script reader for producer Scott Rudin, then at Columbia Pictures, Orion, and MGM. Eventually, his spec script, The Cell, later made into the 2000 movie starring Jennifer Lopez, launched his career as a screenwriter. The Cell caught the attention of Bonaventura and a meeting between the two would be set up. In 1997, it was announced that the next take on the material was to be a heavily anticipated collaboration between star Arnold Schwarzenegger and the legendary director Ridley Scott. Other stars had been mentioned in connection with the project, but Schwarzenegger had remained the studio's first choice especially since he was starring in Warner Brothers' Batman and Robin, of which the studio were pretty certain was going to be a huge success. Ridley Scott would immediately begin development, referring to the script as a very good screenplay. In regards to telling a story that begins with a virus that has devastated the world, Scott would say to writer Paul Salmon that, part of the beauty of this central idea, where Matheson really came up with something, was the fact that legend starts after the fact, you come in after the plague into a whole different world. That really appealed to me. 
I connected I Am Legend most strongly with Robinson Crusoe, the story of a man who suffers terrible isolation until he meets his man Friday. That was the strongest parallel for me, and that's why I was eager to work with Arnold on this. I felt I could take his usual screen persona into a new area, one that dealt with suffering. Indeed, the material promised to show Schwarzenegger in a role that would show range and depth, in material that promised to be more grounded in pathos than any of his previous action movie leading man roles. Scott would switch the location of the script from San Francisco to a contemporary Los Angeles setting and would then choose to bring his own screenwriter, John Logan. Logan's instructions were to give the script a page one rewrite, and up until Protasevich was pushed off the project, he and Logan would meet to collaborate on the project. Scott would spend a year working on the original draft by Protasevich, and then a procession of multiple drafts with John Logan. The Logan drafts would remove and introduce new elements. The first two-thirds, for example, were practically a dialogue-free, atmospheric exploration of the decimated world, with heavier action set pieces. But when these drafts were set aside, Protasevich was brought back to develop yet another version. The intent was for larger, deeper thematic qualities. John Logan would tell David Hughes that, I don't think I've ever reworked anything as radically as I Am Legend. It was a heroic undertaking. We kept saying, forget movie conventions. What if this really happened? If the human population was wiped out by a bubonic plague, what would happen? We approached it from a very scientific perspective. We talked to scientists and survivalists to find out what the civil defense would be, and then Ridley and I started working together in terms of trying to create that. And what we came up with was a very bold approach to the material. In the first draft, we did this amazing sequence almost entirely without words, through images of civil defense and bodies burning, all set to Wagner's Siegfried's Funeral March, so that it became almost an opera at the end of the world. It was so great. So we did this amazing sequence, almost all visual, of the plague spreading and people getting sick, people dying, the end of the world. Then after that, we opened on a day in Neville's life. The screenwriter would also speak of his decision to jettison Neville's voiceover in favor of silence, saying, We rejected voiceover without even thinking about it, because Neville has no one to talk to, and there's no one to talk to him. So to mitigate that by having him talk to the audience in some abstract way seemed to take away the purity of the notion. We created the conceit that when his wife was dying, she made audio tape recordings for him, and we would play bits of those during the first hour of the movie, so she would narrate his life as he was listening to these tapes, about what it was like to be sick, what the world was going to be like after everyone was gone, how much she cared for him. So for the first hour of the draft, the only voice you heard were these strange, elliptical, nostalgic, romantic voiceovers from his dead wife. It was amazingly bold. Maybe a little too bold. Protasevich felt his original work had been erased in Logan's drafts. He would flatly state that he found Logan's drafts to be dull, somber, and pretentious, and that it would have been a dreary arthouse movie that simply did not work. Protasevich felt a little wounded by Scott's decision to bring John Logan in. The writer would speak to Fangoria magazine a few years later and recall that, The original script I wrote was received very well. That got Arnold Schwarzenegger and Ridley Scott interested. Then I was promptly fired so Ridley Scott could work with the writer he wanted. The writer was a good one, but he was not the right person for this project. The whole thing almost completely fell apart. So I was brought back and I worked with Ridley and that was the script that almost got made. That was about a week away from production. There was an up and running art department. People were being hired. Under the supervision of production designer Arthur Max, a small art department would assemble, including concept artists, Tani Kunitake, and Sylvian Desperates. Desperates at the time was working on Tim Burton's Superman Lives and was starting to grow disillusioned with the senseless antics of producer John Peters and he was close to quitting when he happened to see Ridley Scott on the Warner Brothers backlot. He says, I ran into Ridley Scott and so went over to say hello and at one point in the conversation he said, grinning, so how are you enjoying Superman? And I said, well, and he explained that he was here with I Am Legend, this big Schwarzenegger picture that I had only just read about. I was given an open invitation to drop by and look around, which I did that very afternoon. I had seen the Omega Man in the 70s. I always remembered that tremendous opening scene with Charlton Heston rolling down a deserted Los Angeles and crashing his car into a dealership and getting into another one. Personally, I thought it was a bit odd that they were remaking the film, 
but at the end of the day, I didn't care because Ridley Scott was making another science fiction film and I wanted to be on it. Ridley had been away in England for a couple of weeks, and I had the chance to read the script and the book. When he came back, we had an 8.30 a.m. meeting, and he sat down and said, So, scene one. And we just started going at it. He had the first scene completely sketched out and talked me through it, noting which buildings were not going to be used. He would talk about certain elements he was considering that I would then take away to work up to a level that would be practical. Then you can hand them to people and not only discuss the terms of where action is going to be placed, but also what the subtle elements of the action are. He explains it very precisely because he knows what he's doing. He doesn't just tell me what to do, he also sketches it. He does little diagrams telling me where the camera is and what we will be looking at. Ridley is a better storyboard artist than almost any working storyboard artist in the business. If you look at his drawings, they're stunning. You can see the juice of the composition, he just knows what he wants and he's good at it. Usually, he's very random. He'll kind of dream up scenes. His favorite thing to say is, Okay, I thought this scene would open like this. I don't know why, but instinctively, I see it this way. And that's how it starts. Arthur Max had done tons of research on starvation and burn victims. There were some very gory photographs that we looked at depicting different deficiencies and illness. We also went through many documentaries because Ridley told us he wanted an emaciated look and was thinking about using CGI to give actors a skeletal appearance. I found this extraordinary medical book on skinless bodies, atrocious stuff, and everyone thought it was great to use. Despite the fact that, unfortunately, it never became a picture, it was the best drawing I've ever done, and the energy was so charged up, and we were all so into it that I still think of it as my best experience at the drawing board working on a film. Had it been made, he adds, it probably wouldn't have been so rewarding because there's no way that anything that would have happened afterwards would have come close to what happened during those months. It was heaven. Kunitake, when speaking of the vampiric hemocytes, said, Early on, the concepts were that we wanted to see them physically degenerate, so they would look like your typical modern vampire wearing street clothes. But as they degenerate throughout time, they slowly lost all their pigment, and then they began to lose their moisture and dry out, so that they started to bandage themselves to keep their skin moist. He didn't want them lumbering around like Night of the Living Dead. He wanted them extremely fast, so they were running around like agile mummies. Scott would scout locations in the more secluded areas of Texas as a stand-in for a post-apocalyptic LA, saying, Just watching this man survive and the gathering storm of the hemocytes, what are those things? On one hand, we had great scenes in old landmarks like the Ambassador Hotel Lobby or the Wax Museum. Then there was the place where he lived which was like an ultra-modern architectural movie star home, which was very secure, but he'd done a lot of things to make it even more secure. Kunitake would later say, The idea was that it was a very modern fire station, with all these abstract angles and fragmented shafts of light coming through. The building's defenses included a moat filled with gasoline, arrow slits through which sighted weapons could be trained, and a perimeter defense of floodlights and landmines. It was going to be a total build from top to bottom, with electrics and everything, on a hillside overlooking Los Angeles. Despretz would speak of the location design and that time had stood still, so you just had carcasses of cars, a lot of dust everywhere, animal footprints. There was a subway system, which was influenced by a lot of techie Parisian designs, and you saw a few solar-powered phone booths, so there were changes, but they were subtle. It sort of gave you a feeling about what might have happened around 2005, which was then about eight years off. The trend in Hollywood at the time was to exercise extreme caution when it came to rising budgets. Fox 2000 would put the brakes on Jan Dubon's proposed epic, Ghost Riders in the Sky, following monetary losses from Volcano and Speed 2, not to mention the much-publicized overspend on James Cameron's Titanic. Universal Studios would halt pre-production on Jonathan Hansley's Hulk, Warner Brothers would then follow suit and choose to discontinue production on I Am Legend in March of 1998. Every studio is acutely conscious of how much the negative cost of their films are. We're not alone, de Bonaventura said. Schwarzenegger would later speak to the LA Times in reference to the fact he underwent elective heart surgery to replace a faulty valve in 1997. Arnold would say, I had several projects set up, including I Am Legend. All of a sudden, it became impossible. The script was too expensive. The director was too slow. Everything was wrong when nothing was. 
I really could feel people kind of one inch at a time pulling back. You know, they don't return your phone calls the same way they used to, or all of a sudden the guy's on the phone all the time, or he's on a trip. It was like, maybe now we can't sell him as an action star. Now he's not the kind of superhuman that kids think he is. I heard it from other sources, what those studio executives said. Arnold would reiterate the real reason for the film getting pulled from Warner's slate in his autobiography, Total Recall, My Unbelievably True Life Story. He wrote, I didn't even notice at first that the studios were holding back. But when I started submitting stories and scripts I wanted to do, people were slow responding. I became aware that the studio seemed reluctant to commit really big money. Fox was backing away from the idea of Terminator 3. Warner put the brakes on I Am Legend, a post-apocalyptic vampire script that I was supposed to shoot that fall with Ridley Scott directing. He wanted a budget of $100 million, while Warner wanted to spend only $80 million. That was the reason the studio gave for pulling back anyway. The real reason was my heart surgery. Desperates would say, When we heard Arnie was going to be in it, none of us could picture him in that role. And by the time we were finished, we could not imagine anybody else. Kunitake would also say that Ridley Scott would have done for vampire films what Alien did for monster movies, saying, It would have been pretty spectacular. The artist also felt that Schwarzenegger would go on to put a lot of his Neville character into his future work. In regards to the progress that had been made with the screenplay prior to this, Ridley Scott would say, I felt we'd licked the first two acts. We were still working on the third one. There was a lot of talk, of course, of coming up with an ending where Neville would find his Eve or another group of normal human beings. I resisted that. I wanted the ending to emphasize the idea that, among all other animals, the human race is unique. Whatever the problems, it will always carry on. So even though Neville has an awareness that he may be the last normal person, he perseveres. I liked ending on that. He is the last person. I mean, that's why it's called I Am Legend, right? As to the studio's concern with trimming the budget, Scott said, To do this kind of film today, which shows one man living in a desolate, deserted city, costs a certain amount of money. You can't just do it on the street with the budget I was given. I said, look, it can be done with this budget. Interestingly, we weren't that far apart on the question of how much we needed to do this properly. But then Warner suddenly said, shut it down. I felt that I couldn't lie. I could have said, yeah, I'll remove 15 million, but the costs would have gone right back up there. So that's what I told them. Rightly or wrongly, I stuck by my guns. In regards to rumors suggesting there were difficulties designing the appearance of the vampires, Scott would say, the tricky thing is that you cannot start illustrating vampires by having them running around in monk's robes and sunglasses, as they did with the Omega Man. That's not the way to arrive at what I would call an A-class movie. And God knows, I didn't want I Am Legend to be a Fang movie, where you have people with pale faces and long white teeth. I was a little uncomfortable with that. I did want the vampires to look monstrous without humanizing them. Then they started to become too human-looking, which became a huge problem, so we let that one go. Scott and the studio had parted ways. He would later tell Empire Magazine, I crossed the street and made Gladiator instead. It was a good move. We would see artist Carrie Gamble's concept drawing of the vampires. From the archives of Steve Johnson's XFX Studios, this artwork appeared in the artist's book, Drawing Monsters and Heroes for Film and Comics. The sketches would show how the artist had envisioned Scott's initial concept for the movie's hemocytes. Matheson had read drafts of the screenplay when Legend was in development, and he would say, The script wasn't bad, it just wasn't my book, but I'm sure Ridley would have done a great job. He's a brilliant director. During the pre-production phase, Scott would hire the famed FX company Amalgamated Dynamics to create creature effects for the vampires. Makeup artists Tom Woodruff Jr. and Alec Gillis would later release footage of what the monsters from Scott's I Am Legend could have looked like. Gillis would say, Imagine sitting in a room full of incredible pre-production art while the director describes every detail of what is sure to be a classic science fiction film. Now imagine that the director is Ridley Scott. Half of your brain reels with excitement over the possibility of working with this cinema legend. The other half wonders if you really deserve the opportunity. But you get the chance, and you and your team knock yourselves out. When you walk the actress in full makeup in front of Sir Ridley, you see a squint of the eye, and then a smile and a wink of approval. Ridley Scott's version of I Am Legend was just a bit too expensive for the studio's taste. Ridley moved on to Gladiator, 
and the screen test shot in the ADI display room was lost, misplaced somewhere at Warner Brothers. Then a couple of years ago, we got a call, summoned to meet again to discuss Prometheus 2. For two hours, we sat in a room filled with concept art, listening to Ridley pitch the story of the Alien prequel. When production opted to shoot in London, we knew we wouldn't be involved. That's okay. We worked on his version of I Am Legend, the film that might have been. We were brought in on a four-month design period to come up with the look of these hemocyte characters when Ridley Scott was involved in the film. We started off with uh, miniature maquettes to show body designs, and then we moved on to uh, full-scale busts to develop the uh, kind of gaunt look of the characters. This whole design process was really interesting. At this point, we didn't know if these were going to be accomplished with bodysuits or prosthetics or maybe even animatronic puppets, so everything was up for grabs. Ridley's idea was to use some of the old Italian waxwork figures from the 1700s as a basis for the hemocyte looks. We figured silicone would be the great material to copy the look of those waxworks because it was so translucent and fleshy. We had a great sculpture team, including Steve Koch, Ryan Peterson, George Duchel, and Jeff Picaccio. Painting was done by Mike Larrabee. We played around with the idea of the hemocytes covering themselves with uh, UV protective mud and wrapping themselves in plastic. Plastic seemed like it was an uncomfortable choice for these non-human characters. We thought that was interesting. We also had Barry Coper working with us on the application for the test. We had had a history with Barry Coper on the Santa Claus movies, so it was a great change of pace for us to work on this kind of horror subject matter with him. Silicone appliances were new at the time. This wasn't the first time it was done, but it was definitely a new process and we were trying to make the most of it. Ridley found an actress who uh, was sort of of average uh, stature, not too thin uh, and not too full. He was curious as to how lean we could make a sort of normal person look. There were two different main makeup looks we created for our model. One was that of a uh, sort of somewhat affected face, and the other was an extremely emaciated face. The idea was to come up with as many different looks as possible so that on set we could give them more variations by putting a silicone skin over top, for example. Because we had four months to explore designs, we were able to get into variations that showed a lot of contrast, a lot of different colorations, some bright, vivid colors, some knocked down, more dulled colors. This was going to be a great opportunity for us to work uh, on a feature film with Ridley Scott, who's one of our big idols. But uh, unfortunately, we consider this show to be one that got away. We were contacted by Warner Brothers to be involved in the Will Smith version, but uh, as it turned out, they were more interested in using a digital approach than a makeup approach. The nice thing about Studio ADI is it gives us a chance to share some of these images of different things that could have been. Desperates would later refer to his time on the project as the most rewarding experience I've ever had in film, saying, I think they believed that they were going to do a big sort of Terminator thing because they had Arnold. They had the future, a devastated future. So they felt that by association, that's what they were getting. Then Ridley came back with a mood piece that to me was extraordinary, but that wasn't what the studio had really hoped for. In regards to why the film project was canceled, Desperate said that most of the rumors and whispers printed at the time were wrong, saying, It started with the actor's fee being too expensive. The thing you have to keep in mind is that if a $100 million film spends one-fifth of its budget on the star, it suffers. That's one-fifth that can't be allocated to either visual effects or sets, and that seriously compromises the ability to make the film, and everybody was unanimous that the film needed to be more expensive. I think there was also another problem that nobody could agree with what the film was saying. I think the studio thought a lot about the picture and debated about the point of making it. They were afraid of an apocalyptic story which did not have an upbeat ending. They were really scared of that. It was a film that basically had an actor, a dog, and a bunch of dead bodies walking around. At one point, someone at the studio actually said, We like the script, we just don't think there's enough people in it. While someone else said, We need a romantic interest. If Ridley could have done what he wanted, it would have been a terrific film. It would have been a stunning mood piece, unlike anything that anyone would have expected or had been released. It was way beyond an action movie. It had action in it, but the film didn't depend on it. The character of Neville was so original. 
Ridley had very interesting ideas on how to use him and his nature as an architect. By the time he'd become the last man on Earth, he had actually turned his home into an incredible museum of beautiful paintings and gorgeous structures. He had gone to the Getty Museum and had just taken Monet paintings and put them in his house. After spending many months prepping the production of I Am Legend, production designer Arthur Max would comment that, It's part of the business. You work on research and development, and sometimes the ideas don't fly. And I'm glad this one didn't, because we got to do Gladiator instead. In between Scott's departure and Will Smith's arrival on the project, Arnold Schwarzenegger would remain with the producer title. Rob Botton and Michael Bay were, at different times, each attached to direct, and Mark Protasevich would resume script duties, working with Akiva Goldman's radically altered concepts before reverting back to something similar to the original 1996 draft. Before Warner Brothers would finally sign up director Francis Lawrence and I Am Legend would finally premiere in cinemas in December of 2007. As for what could have been, with Matheson's themes of despair, loss, grief, melancholia, and human loneliness studied and filtered through the lens of Ridley Scott, it's fair to say the world missed out. Thanks for watching.